Question 81. Ravi Mira is an Indian citizen working in India for the U.S. branch of a Canadian bank. Referral fees are allowed in the U.S. and in Canada, but not in India. If the company offers referral fees, what is the most likely action to be taken by Ravi Mira CFA? Um, so since he is a CFA charter holder, he's held to the code and standards. Um, and there's a few things at play here. So he's Indian, um, but he's working for the U.S. branch of a Canadian bank. So we've got three different countries' laws here, and they're cl clearly conflicting due to the referral fees. Um, so in the case of conflicting laws, we are always going to go with the more strict law that we need to follow. Um, so in this case, the laws are relating to the referral fees. The most strict law would be not taking referral fees, um, which is the law in India. So let's look at our answers here and see if we have that. Uh, Mara should not accept the referral fees. That sounds like it's going to be our answer, but let's just rule out B and C. Uh, Mira should accept the referral fees and disclose the referral fees. Um, we're going to cross that off since it involves accepting the fees. Mira should accept the fees, and there's no requirement to make any disclosure as the referral fees are allowed in U.S. and Canada. Uh, doing that would not be following the most strict law, so we still go with A, um, not accepting the referral fees. Question 82. Ali Nabil, CFA, covers the real estate sector of the Middle East. Emar Group, a real estate company in Dubai, has gotten a few phone calls from Nabil, who is trying to estimate the company's value. Emar runs 878 Hotel in Dubai and recently offered Nabil a trip to Dubai and stay at 878 at Emar Group's expense. Which of the following is the most appropriate action that Nabil should take to not violate any CFA Institute code and standards? Uh, a. Ali should decline the offer. B. Ali should accept the offer and mention it in his research report. Or C. Ali should accept the offer and inform his supervisor about the offer. Uh, we could go ahead and cross off C right away, I think, there, because any gifts, um, which is what this would be classified as, is going to need to be run by the supervisor or compliance before accepting. So this is implying that he's accepting it first and then informing, which is going to be a no-no. Um, so we can cross that off right away. So with A and B, we're kind of looking at whether they should decline or whether they can accept. Um, so per the code and standards, analysts should not accept gifts from companies that they follow or cover. Um, and this is because it could endanger their uh, independence and objectivity if they're getting nice gifts and trips um, from the company, then that's going to potentially cloud their judgment and uh, influence their research report. So the code goes far enough or beyond needing to just disclose it, which is what would be implied in B um, and says that we need to decline the offer. So we'll go with A. Question 83. Laura Halden, CFA, has worked for a full-service uh, brokerage firm. She recently met with a client and informed them that her firm could provide the services they need. After understanding all the requirements, has Halden most likely violated Standard 1C misrepresentation given the information mentioned above? Uh, so we've got yes or no, no. So first we need to determine whether or not we think she... Uh, violated this standard. So um, she met with the client and then she informed them that could, they could provide the services after understanding all the requirements. So this doesn't have any um, indication of her misrepresenting the services they could provide or not understanding the situation. Uh, so I think we can go ahead and cross out that she did violate. So now that we're at no, she didn't violate. There's two reasons for why she didn't violate. Um, so we've got B, no, Halden is not in violation as this was only oral communication, or C, is not in violation of her commitment since it was based on facts. I think we can really go back to the what we said for the first one. I mean, she's saying that she can provide the services after, keyword after, understanding all the requirements that the client has. Um, so we can say that this is based on facts um, and go with C. And it 
the fact that it's oral or written communication uh, really doesn't matter in this instance. So that can kind of push us towards C as well. Question 84. Marco Triali, CFA, works for a large bank in New York City. He has recently been arrested for participating in a nonviolent protest against capitalism. Has Triali most likely violated any CFA code and standards, CFA Institute code and standards? Uh, yes, he's violated duties to employer. B, he's violated standards of uh, standard ID professional misconduct or no he has not violated any of the code and standards um the standards are related to professional conduct and the nature of the crime doesn't necessarily endanger the reputation of marco um, or the firm since it's a non-violent crime and it's more uh activist related um so we're going to go with c this is not a violation um, where this would kind of become a little more gray or become a, become a little more in the gray area or become a violation is if the crime is related more to fraud or dishonesty, stealing, um, something of that sort that's going to really uh, damage the reputation of that person and therefore the employer that they work for. So we'll uh, stick with C, no violation. Question 85. Jana Reynolds took the CFA level one exam last week. She signed the CFA Institute pledge and though she has obeyed all provisions related to exam rules. However, she was exiting the exam room. As she was exiting the exam room, a proctor heard uh, Reynolds state to another candidate, this exam had nothing to do with the CFA practice questions. For this reason, the exam proctor reported Reynolds for violating standard 7A, conduct as a participant in the CFA Institute programs. Has Reynolds violated standard 7A, conduct as uh, participants in the CFA Institute programs? Um, this one is pretty tricky um, because it seems that this would fall under a violation. However, when we look at this closely... She's just saying the exam had nothing to do with the CFA practice questions. Um, she's not divulging any specific information about questions that were on the exam. Um, so this is going to be no, not a violation. Um, and, you know, as it mentions, allows for negative opinions to be expressed by members and, members and uh, candidates. Um, which goes contrary to this one here, which... Uh, would say that you're not allowed to have a negative opinion. So we can cross that off. And then for B, we'll rule this one out. Um, the standard, it's saying that the standard disallows candidates from speaking to one another for at least 12 hours act after the exam. The hour time limit is pretty arbitrary. It's more so the subject matters that you're not allowed to speak on. So if she had said something more specific like, the exam had no questions on the derivatives reading for, or we didn't use the formula for free cash flow to equity. That's when this would start uh, becoming an issue. But since the statement's pretty vague, um, there's no violation here. And there's not going to be any time limit on when you can speak up about the specifics of the exam um, with other candidates. So go with A. Question 86. Which of the following is least likely expected from a member with fiduciary responsibility for a pension plan? A, the member should always act in the interest of plan participants. Um, so since this is certainly expected, um, that's basically the definition of being a fiduciary, uh, we can cross out A. B, the member should make judgments from the perspective of the total portfolio. This also sounds like something that... Uh, would fall under the fiduciary duty. So I think we can cross that off as well. And key here is fiduciary responsibility for the pension plan. Um, so they're going to have fiduciary responsibility to make decisions for that plan at the total portfolio level. Uh, so let's make sure C sounds like it could be our answer. In the case of a proxy fight, the member should provide support to the sponsor's management. Um, keyword providing support to the sponsor's management. Uh, this is not 
this could be what they're supposed to do, um, but they should only do this if uh, it benefits the pension plan participants. Um, if because they don't have a fiduciary manage fiduciary duty to the sponsor's management, we uh, underlined here who the fiduciary responsibility is to. So if doing so benefits the pension plan, then they should do it. But if not, then uh, it's not their duty to. So we go with answer C. Question 87. Asun Almas, CFA, has been managing the portfolio of Mrs. Sanum for the past year. Almas was able to earn good returns for Mrs. Sanum and requested that Mrs. Sanum tell her friends about the above average returns that she could earn on her portfolio. Is uh, Almas most likely in violation of standard 3D performance presentation? Um, so first level decision here, no, are we violating or yes, are we violating since we have one no and two yeses. Um, you know, the uh, this sounds like it's probably going to be a violation um, since we're requesting that above average returns are the uh, are going to be the norm in the portfolio and what we're requesting them to tell. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and rule out A for now, um, assuming this probably will buy, be a violation. So then we'll look at our two reasons for violating. So Almas is violating the standard as the message does not pass the test of completeness. So this sounds like it could be our answer. And the main reason here is um, we've been managing the portfolio for the past year. This isn't... Uh, and it's saying we're able to generate good returns but now we're kind of extrapolating that into um, tell your friends that I can earn them an above average return on their portfolio. Um, so a one year track record isn't likely good enough to back up that statement. So this could probably be our answer. And so we'll look at C, Almas is violating the standard as she cannot request that her client talk about the portfolio performance to other. Uh, there's no violation here in asking the clients for basically referrals or to mention their services or returns to other um, potential clients. Uh, so that's going to leave us back with B, um, violating due to not passing the test of completeness. Question 88. Ignacio Dawson is an investment advisor at Larson Securities. Hubert Padilla, a high net worth client, offered Dawson a 2% profit sharing each year on achieving a return above 20%, to which Dawson agrees. When Padilla asked about brokerage, Dawson advises Padilla to shift his brokerage towards Willis Brokers as they are the best in town in terms of pricing and service quality. When Padilla left, Dawson wrote an email to his employer regarding his compensation arrangement with Padilla. The next day, Dawson received a cash check in the name of Larson Securities from Willis Brokers for introducing the new client to them. Uh, Dawson has most likely violated standard uh, 6B, sorry, 4B, additional compensation arrangements by uh, failing to disclose Padilla about Larson's arrangement with Willis Brokers, accepting Padilla's offer before obtaining permission from his employer, uh, and then C is going to be both of these. Um, so digging in here, it's obvious, uh, it's not directly said, but it's implied when Dawson receives a check from Larson, or uh, uh, from Willis Brokers for introducing the new client to them. If uh, referral fees are at play, we should always be disclosing this. Um, so th we know that this is going to be a violation here. So failing to disclose um, to Padilla about the arrangement with the broker. We know that's going to be a violation, so since those both include that uh, failing to disclose that, so we can cross off this. So now we need to look at the uh, additional compensation arrangement. So Dawson is getting the 2% profit sharing each year um, from the client, and the issue here comes in um, the... When Padilla left, Dawson then asked his employer uh, for the compensate about the compensation arrangement, um, or most so is just telling him that this is going to be the arrangement. So rather than this being the situation, we need to get uh, 
permission from our employer in order to do so first. So he's agreeing to it and then do, uh, and then going to his employer after. He needs to get permission from his employer first. Um, and that's really just goes back to the uh, different incent, uh, ways that incentives can cause us to act. Um, so if he's earning this uh, profit sharing on returns above 20%, uh, Dawson is going to be much more inclined to take higher risk in uh, Padilla's portfolio since he's going to get paid a lot more for those higher returns, but his downside is not uh, as big since he's not he's sharing in the profits, not the losses. So we are going to go with C. Both of these arrangements are uh, violations of standard 4B. Question 89. Dan Walton, CFA, is a supervisor of a research analyst team at Pioneer Investing. Walton noticed that Eva Peters developed a new model and started trading based on the new model without testing it. Walton asked Peters to stop trading immediately. When Walton inquired further into the situation, he realized that the company has no policy or guidelines for testing the new models. What is the most appropriate action to be taken by Walton in this situation? So we've got A, Walton should fire Peters for not testing the model. B, Walton should report Peters to the compliance team. Or C, Walton should encourage the firm to develop guidelines for testing the new models. Um, so it doesn't sound great for Peters in just uh, developing the model and starting to trade without testing it. Um, however, we're asking what Walton needs to do in this situation. And I think the key here is the company has no policy or guidelines for testing new models. Um, so within that context, Peters really did nothing wrong. He or, or she um, created the model and started testing it. It was within uh, the guidelines. So it's hard to make the case that we should fire Peters for uh, doing what was allowed under comp company policy. Um, and with that being said, I think it's also tough to make the case that we should be reporting Peters to compliance since what he did was within compliance. Um, so the main uh, course of action here is to make compliance a little bit stronger. And so Walton should encourage the firm to develop guidelines for testing of new models. We'll go with answer C. Question 90. Paul Teshma is preparing a research report on a new drug called ABXV4 in the oncology industry. He gets in touch with a few scientists and medical professionals working in oncology and obtains information about competing oncology treatments. Most of these drugs are in the preclinical development phase, which is public information. It's probably important, so I'll highlight it. In his research report, Teshma concludes that ABXV4 might have some competing drugs coming into the market in the next few years if the preclinical trials prove successful. Has Teshma most likely violated any CFA code and standards? Um, so there's nothing indicating here that he obtained any material non-public information, which is probably the only way that he would be violating the standards here. So we've got no, didn't violate, yes, violated, and yes, violated. Since he didn't violate, we can uh, go ahead and choose A. Let's take a look at B and C just to see what they say, though. Uh, yes, he violated due to... Uh, due to the standard on material non-public information, as we concluded, um, he likely didn't receive any material NPI. Um, you're allowed to talk to people in the industry. This would be no different than talking to the CFO or CEO of a publicly traded company. So we can go ahead and cross that off. And related to violated the standards related to not performing due diligence to confirm the reliability of the, of the information. It sounds like he did pretty good due diligence here, contacted quite a few scientists and medical professionals working in the industry, um, and also is looking at all these drugs that have public information. He probably did good due diligence here, so we can cross that off as well. And we'll stick with A.